but it's just that it took, uh, we are already four years on the go. And we even started in 2015 with our first workshop. So it's, a, it's been a long, a long project, but we learned a lot and we like to share the more recent things with you today. And uh, we are looking forward to your feedback. So the project is uh, an MDO, which is Dutch research funding, urbanizing the office of the world, integrated and sustainable for development in Africa. And we selected a project in Ghana as a pilot. Uh, the project was um, inspired by Maaswatatu, which is the port, expansion port of Rotterdam, which was could be called truly sustainable and stakeholder inclusive. So we wanted to, we learned from that and we wanted to see if we could copy this in, in, in other places in the world together with the a, with a, with a local, uh, local stakeholders. So the project features the balance between morphology, economic, ecological and social processes. So a truly PPP project. In this case, interdisciplinary co-creation with African stakeholders and a bottom-up approach from practical cases that's why we, how we choo choose the port of Tema as a pilot into tools and the generic framework. And uh, I will introduce how we, what our objections were, and Jill will pick up and uh, tell about the, the results and uh, so what, what, what the state of the art is at the moment and how we're closing. Uh, the, it's a project with many partners, TU Delft, and then University of Ghana, which is, has been very important as a partner to, to link to the, to the local situation and to students and professors. UNESCO IHE, the VIR, uh, which is uh, ecological engineering and, and university in, in, uh, in the Netherlands, the FU in Amsterdam, which is economics of ecosystem services, Delta Aris, World Wildlife Fund, and very important, the Dutch uh, a number of Dutch companies which were organized through the Netherlands African Business Council. And uh, so the budget was there in the beginning. Uh, three postdocs, one PhD, in Ghanaian researchers, and uh, it was approved May 2016 when we started. And the list of companies who sponsored the project are below. And I must say we we kept between within budget. So that's all well. Outcomes of the project, uh, they should be, and they, they were formulated like a framework. So best practice guidance for implementing integrated and sustainable for development. Scientific papers, which we already uh, produced a number, which are on the website and also within ISAC, the tool of NDO. Uh, we developed tools, quick design tools like remote sensing, but also tried and tested methods for stakeholder inclusive planning and uh, a community uh, of uh, green ports with an Af African network, and Harry Barnes Daban is here. He is uh, he is representing that network very much in person in Africa. So we're very glad that we're linked to them as well. And then um, I think the core characteristic of the project is that we design for stakeholder values in port development in Africa. So you really design for values, which means that you not simply design a port for port operations or cargo transfer, but you can do much more with a port uh, with regard to fisheries, recreation, but also quality of life in the hinterland connections. And if you think like that, if you design for values, you include the stakeholders from the beginning, you create value for them, and it's much more accepted in the end of the project, I would say. Then, Today, the agenda. <clears throat> so we are now in the final workshop, which means that we closed the project and we made a draft final report. And we like your input on today on our results and presentations so that we can also put some uh, feedback in the report and the evaluation. Um, so first we start as I do now with the welcome and the introduction of the workshop. Then we have a number of presentations, a short recap from Jill, and then the last results by Lisa Lott from the University of Amsterdam, then uh, the results from Ghana by Professor Quasi, and then we have um, a short break. After that, you, we all get together again, and then we get an explanation <clears throat> on the breakout sessions. So we have some breakout sessions where uh, you can give your feedback 
and on the on the results in a, in a smaller group. Then again, a break, and then in the end, conclusions and closing, uh, where we have our final thoughts on the utility of the research program, which will be moderated by Dan Rijks. He is also uh, with, with us now, and he is uh, the chairman of our advisory board, which has advised us during the project. And the last, their last meeting was already the December last year, but uh, we they have, they have helped us uh, a long way on the way. And then we have the finalization and the, the thank you. So that's uh, that's it for um, for the program. And then now I would like to hand over the the word to Jill for the short recap and the state of affairs. Okay. Thank you. Jill, can you share your screen for your presentation? Yeah. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yeah. you can start the, the slideshow. Yeah, go to slideshow and start from the beginning. Okay. okay. Um, so I'll just be, I'm recapping on the integrated framework because in the, in the midterm review, we presented all of our results at that stage. And from then on, the majority of the work went to finalizing um, uh, publication outputs, carrying on with dissemination and the ecosystem valuation um, work that Lisa Lott will present after me. So in this presentation, I am recapping on what we already told you in the midterm review. So our overarching um, aim was to develop a generic framework and tools for the design of integrated and sustainable ports. And then through a stakeholder inclusive and bottom up approach. And we had this focus on Tema port in Ghana. And you can see immediately that the challenges are to integrate and synthesize across disciplines to work with stakeholders, drawing in the diverse sources of knowledge in a sustainable manner, to work in a data poor situation where development is uh, uh, important, and to clarify, because it's supposed to be a generic framework, how and when the framework can be applied, when it's applicable or not. And so what is this framework? It's, um, it has three components. It has a component which is to the setup of the overarching co-design process. Almost, Tito's already mentioned it. Our philosophy, huh? value-based, stakeholder-inclusive, ecosystem-based, and future-proof, and how you do that. Then it has the core, and the core is a port design hierarchy, which I'll explain a little bit about later. And it's about looking for alternatives to port development, port site, alternatives, port layout alternatives and structures and materials. And so making sure that you design your port in, is in as ecosystem friendly a way as possible. And then it has a suite, a compendium of methods that are how you apply these things so that it's not just us able to apply it, but that the resources are there for others to use these methods. And what I'll quickly describe to you now is I'll go through the methods that we have already we had already established by the midterm review. So the stakeholder inclusive value based approach, the ecos the core, the ecosystem based approach of the ports, and then Lisa Lot will carry on with the ecosystem valuation. So the philosophy, as Tito already already mentioned, of the overarching co design process is that it has takes place in a to a particular place and takes knowledge of that place into account. It includes stakeholders from the beginning and it takes this nature-based approach. And very important, we're a design-oriented um, project. So we, we're looking to improve that design process 
and meet the developmental challenges that are there. And what does that mean we did? Well, we made a nested process and this is just showing you the nesting. The first thing underlying everything is a process of transdisciplinary learning in the research team between Ghana, the Netherlands and between disciplines. Then comes a process in Ghana itself, a broader stakeholder engagement, broader than the port and including stakeholders that you can't get into a workshop. So people that have livelihood dependence on the system, the director of the port who has a power difference with people that you could get into a workshop. So this broader nested approach and then central engaging with actual port stakeholders in workshops and then again coming zooming out from that uh, uh, engagement process with the workshops with port stakeholders, other dissemination activities that allow others to link on. So the book on sustainable ports, the pilot project based theory of how you disseminate knowledge, and the ecosystem valuation work of these a lot. And where we are now is the ongoing UDEVE 2 and UDEVE 3, the, the research embedding with other research projects and finalizing of the project. And so the core there you saw was a transdisciplinary game structuring workshop that we had in Tamer in 2017. It's, a, it's published theory already on how you do these workshops. It's a six step workshop, includes um, inputs from stakeholders and scientists. And what it produced was, and you see that in, that, in the lower um, picture, it produced a shared system story of Tamer Port, which allowed us to link on and see what kind of alternatives uh, could be designed into the future. And it produced utopian and dystopian visions that were value-based so that people started to understand what they cared about in Tamer. And so that's the, uh, that's the core output and the core structuring of the stakeholder-based, the value-based approach that we adopted. And now what are the products from the, at the core, the ecosystem-based uh, port design application. And that is mainly done by um, Viva de Boer and Arno Kangeri um, when they um, developed and linked ecosystems and port design. And so what was the approach? The approach is to develop an ecosystem-based port design hierarchy using what was there and using Tamer as the case study. So they looked at the strategic environmental assessments and the um, ecosystem assessments of the port. And they looked at potential alternatives. And the basic approach was what's possible given the context of the situation, what has been done and what by using our framework and bringing in alternative and deeper understanding of the system and of nature-based methods and of the stakeholders, what improvements would have been possible. And um, that resulted in the development of this core framework that's based on environmental impact theory, actually, where you try and avoid an impact at, at all. And as you move down and you try to offset impact as more and more impact mitigate and offset impact. And we, discovered that of course it's um, the higher and earlier you're able to include ecosystem-based considerations in a port design the more that you can avoid um, and uh, avoid the negative side effects and gains more of the positive side effects of ports so earlier and wider identification of these alternatives leads to can improve marine port infrastructure design and seaport developments in future. And we include the methods from De Boer et al in our compendium of methods. So that became the core of the, so you can see we're filling these three parts of the, of the uh, design framework. We filled some of the overarching how you do the stakeholder engagement and value-based assessment. We, we make the core and we fill it and show its application to Tamer. And we fill in each time we're publishing and filling in the method um, part of the framework. And then there another, which we didn't expect in the beginning, but another product from uh, Viba as well 
is an innovative method of, for looking at um, based on satellite e, e, based on analysis of satellite images and it looks at the coastline evolution of a number of, of ports around the whole African coast and results also in a pan-African seaport database that is being used. Um, we notice, we see the downloads and we notice who's looking at it and it's primarily engineers, port engineers, looking at the database and, and looking, getting inspiration from it. It's not being cited because it's being used practically in design. Um, and so what you see here is I've explained to you that as we had already explained at the midterm workshop and as we have published, we have developed methods on the setup overarching co-design process. We have developed the core, the port design hierarchy, and we have filled in the compendium of methods. But there's one part that we haven't talked about and we haven't really explained in great detail, and that's the ecosystem valuation. And that's where that spread, not just from Tama, but into the um, Volta Delta as well. And that is the, what um, Lisa Lott will now be explaining to you. Thank you. Oh, and I have, um, I have all the references because these will be posted later so that you can find all of these um, uh, papers. And of course, on our database, they are all available via, our, um, via, via the Sustainable Ports in Africa website. You can download all these things. Well, thank you very much, Jill. Uh, <clears throat> we have some time. We are in, in schedule. So if somebody has a clarifying question, please go ahead and see so that you can prepare your presentation. So when there are no questions at the moment, is a lot you can continue. Yeah, you can see my screen, right? Yes. yes. Presentation. Okay. So yes, as uh, Jill mentioned already, uh, I'm Lise Lotte, and I'm going to present today on the process and the results of the valuation of ecosystem services. So we do economic valuation specifically through surveys and uh, experiments, because first of all, it allows for engagement of citizens. And also by engaging citizens, you, we also raise awareness on certain topics because they get more involved in these uh, topics. And we obtain social welfare estimates and together these aspects lead to insights for both the decision making domain, as well as for citizens themselves. So we collected data in Sakumono, which is right next to the port expansion in Tema as well as in a few smaller villages each uh, east of the Volta estuary and the Volta Delta. For this, um, for this process, we worked together, first of all, with IUCN, who provided some additional funding to collect the surveys. Uh, we, of course, are from IVM. And then we worked together with uh, University of Ghana, with Professor Kwesi's team, uh, the Development Institute with Ken Kinney, and Research Line, which is a local company that specializes in survey data collection. And uh, the first data was collected at the end of 2018. And it was really uh, exploratory to see how people perceive the ecosystems, uh, which ecosystem services are most important to them. And based on that, we drafted a first uh, survey and experiment which we took to Ghana in um, 2019. And after arriving in Ghana, the first thing we did is we went to both the sites, so the Sakumano and the Volta Delta, and we showed a first version of the experiment. We did a few informal interviews, so to find out how people perceive uh, the different aspects of our methodology and where we could improve this. We also organized community meetings in the Volta Delta uh, to inform people of our project and to raise awareness on that we were uh, coming, what we're gonna, gonna do, and also to get approval for our project. And at the same time, there was also a, a broadcast radio show going on on our project. In Sakumono, we went to the community to uh, give out some of the books based on an earlier visit and so to people to show people from which project we are, and of course also to 
announce what we were going to do and that we were going to come back for the third day. So the next step was to improve our methodology and start training uh, local enumerators. So for this, we worked together with Research Line, and we had two teams, one team in Sakumono and one team in the Volta Delta, because they speak two different languages in each side. In total, we had 22 enumerators, and during two days, we would go over all the different aspects of the methodology on how to do interviews, and also, of course, we discussed uh, things related to the environmental topics that we were working on, um, also to improve their understanding on these matters, uh, which was also really nice to see how they also started to think differently about the things around them and the topics they talked about. After this training, uh, we did a first test. So we did a test round, and this test round was um, First of all, for us, of course, to gain more of an idea of how well our methodology is working in the field, but also very much for the enumerators to practice to do actual interviews with respondents and to learn more and uh, ask questions. And in this round, we interviewed uh, about 50 households in both sides. Based on these first results, we had some discussions with both, uh, both uh, the Development Institute and the University of Ghana partners um, to see again whether we could improve certain things about our method. And after that, we did another round of training with the enumerators. And this was also really the chance to like fine tune interview uh, strategies and uh, question formats. And then it was time for the final study um, for which we interviewed about uh, a thousand households uh, evenly divided over two sites. And after we collected this data, we had two more uh, activities. The first one was that a smaller group of enumerators went to all the markets to find out how much uh, ecosystem services that the people in these communities gather uh, cost on the market. So think of different fish species, coconuts, uh, farming products, fruit, those kind of things. And another activity was that the, the Development Institute with uh, Ken did a number of focus group discussions in the Volta Delta to further discuss the survey results. So based on this, um, this process, we found out that uh, the main occupations in the communities are fisher, uh, fishmonger, which are usually uh, women and they smoke and sell the fish, uh, trader and farmer. And I think you can already see here that uh, most of the main occupations are directly related to ecosystem activities. And we also see that in their uh, dependence in terms of food and income. We find that 37% of food consumption comes directly from the local e ecosystems. And by that, we mean uh, that they eat uh, the fish they catch themselves. Probably the food that they buy in the market is also directly from the local ecosystems, but then it's first traded on the market. Uh, for income, we find that about half of all the income is related directly to the local ecosystems due to fisheries, for instance. Therefore, it seems unsurprising that uh, reductions in fish abundance is perceived as a main threat by the community, uh, as is the lack of economic opportunities because uh, the ecosystems are degrading, so they are facing issues there. And at the same time, there are little other opportunities available in the communities. Other threats that were commonly mentioned are plastic pollution, and then mostly related to how plastic pollution affects fisheries and erosion problems. Then we did two types of valuation. Uh, the first one that I'm gonna discuss is the direct market valuation. So in the survey, we asked each household uh, what are what the most important resources are that they extract from the ecosystems. So there can be different types of fish, again, coconuts, fruits, farm products. We also asked them how much of that they gather per week. Um, and this is what the small group of enumerators, the list of all the resources resulting from that survey took to the markets they found out prices of all these different products. And so we were able to 
use this information in combination to estimate the value of each subsurface of each species of fish for uh, the communities. And since we know how many households there are in both communities, we were able to aggregate this information to a overall value of the ecosystem, ecosystems. And this yearly value equals 9.7 million uh, US dollars. So that's quite substantial, I would say. We know that 25% of this is uh, only used for subsistence. So it's never reflected in the market. And that almost 80% is related to fisheries. So again, in negating um, the large role of fisheries uh, in the livelihoods of these communities. The second type of valuation we did was through a choice experiment. Um, and here we value more the future changes that could occur. So during the first step of the research, we asked from a long list of the eco ecosystem services, which services are most important for the households. And these appear to be uh, erosion control, fish abundance, and people visiting the communities. And here in this graph, we can see the results. And for instance, uh, let's focus on Sakumono because that's also the results I'm gonna use in the next slides. Um, we see that the value of reducing erosion by one meter uh, per year equals uh, 10 CDs per household per month. It's a bit complicated, but I'm going to show a little calculation later on. But this is what we can learn from this graph. And we see that increasing fish abundance by 10% is valued higher than the one meter less erosion, whereas increasing visitors uh, less. So if we link the results to the port, uh, I'm going to go back to the first way of valuation, the direct market valuation. Uh, this is a small like back on the envelope example of how these results can be used for port design. So what we see here in the picture is um, where fishing grounds are of the Sakamono community. And what we learned from this is that because this, the port is expanding and it's simply taking in space where the community is fishing currently, um, we lose an area, a fishing area. This area means a reduction of about 25%. We also learned that about 40% of the free series comes from small canoes. And since it's close to the shore, uh, only small canoes would go and fish here. So overall, we estimated that fisheries benefits would be reduced by 10%. Now, if you think back about uh, the, pro so we estimated that each household makes about 170 CDs profit per week from the ecosystems. If we reduce that by 10% and again, aggregate this value for the whole of Sokomono community, we find that um, on a yearly basis, 200,000 200, US dollars uh, will be lost in terms of um, revenues because of uh, this expansion of the port into the Sokomono fishing grounds. If we use the choice experiment to uh, estimate port design effects, uh, we do it a bit differently. So we look more at future changes. So what if, for example, the port would be designed in such a way that no more erosion would appear. So it's like perfectly aligned with coastal processes, for instance. Or if fish abundance would increase with 10% um, because maybe different structures are used that more maybe attract fish or if maybe the lagoon is restored, which allows uh, for fish to have a breeding ground. Uh, and if more 30% more visitors would come, maybe if the port, for example, would also allow for cruise ships. Then we use the numbers of the choice experiment to estimate how much value would be created by these adjustments. So for each adjustment, I calculated a um, change in value per year. And overall, this set of changes, like if a port design would lead to these uh, effects, uh, value will be created equaling about 73,000 US dollars per year. So as a conclusion, um, we feel that this process is crucial to include households in decision-making and raise awareness on relevant topics, to identify risks and vulnerabilities in resource dependence, 
as you could see that especially fishes, uh, fisheries are playing a really large role in these communities. Uh, to mitigate and avoid negative effects or even improve local livelihoods. And during this process, there's a lot of opportunities on building local capacities on methodologies that these parties, uh, these parties and organizations can also use themselves in the future. We furthermore believe that this is necessary to, first of all, guide port design. For instance, we learned that taking into account the effects on fisheries is very important. And later on, also select a best port design or add-on uh, based on a social welfare perspective by linking all the different uh, effects of a port design to the welfare effects estimated through, for instance, the choice experiment. And then based of all, on all this work, we have a few outputs already, a policy brief and a report. And then two scientific papers are in review. One is expected and uh, in the end there should be a dissertation. Thank you. This was my presentation. Well, thank you very much Isabel, for your presentation. Uh, if there is, a, is a, an urgent question now, you can pose it while Professor Kwasi is preparing the next presentation on the Ghana results. And uh, of course, also afterwards, we have time for questions. Jill, there was a question already on the country specific decision making structure, how that's included in the framework. Sorry, I forgot. I had to unmute. Um, that's not specifically included in the, it's not specifically because otherwise we would have had to gear it to particular countries that are organized differently. In the stakeholder inclusive process, we explain that you need to also include traditional leaders and this nested approach deals with the country specific um, uh, uh, stakeholders. You would have to think about which stakeholders do you need to include. So for instance, we decided in this project, we included um, the director of the port, the local planning people, and we went, because we were a project trying to produce something that would be more generically applicable for Africa, we went for the port development um, pan-African level of decision makers about different port developments, because that was what we were interested in. But if you were particular to Ghana, you would look for people from the Ministry of Transport. You would, you were, we made contacts to the people in the Ministry of Tourism and people designing also fishing harbors. So you would look at your specific country and then um, move those things along. And in our case, that is, well, you're coming to Professor Kwasi now, but um, they took uh, the Ghanaian, our Ghanaian partners took this part on of nesting within the Ghanaian situation as we move on and also into the Development Institute and the Volta Delta. Okay, thank you, Jill. I think that's enough for an answer for the moment. I'd like to give the word to Professor Kwasi Pining first and then later we can uh, come back to, this, to these answers and questions. Okay, thank you. But please proceed, uh, Professor Kwasi. Okay, thank you very much, Tido, and uh, thank you, Jill, and hello to everybody. So I will, I will share in this presentation the Ghana team's experience uh, on being part of this very exciting project. I'm trying to... Okay, so it all started when we, we, we had this interaction between our colleagues, scientists from the Netherlands and uh, uh, contacting us about this very interesting project. And we had a common desire and a common goal. And that is to achieve the, the results that we were looking out for, the output of this, um, uh, uh, this project, so achieving the objectives that have been set out for uh, this project. So it was an exciting period. The Ghana team made up of three uh, people from, from the university, myself, Dr. Barnabas Amisigo, and then uh, Adam Mahu. We were so passionate about it, very excited because we felt that it's an opportunity 
to venture into a new area and then learn new things. So we're looking forward to a very interesting and a very exciting project. And let me let me say that we were we we we, we have never been disappointed. It's been an exciting journey. So what has the impact, what has been the impact of the project? The project has impacted the research life of the Ghana team significantly in several ways. Uh, it's opened up our idea and understanding with regards to the green port philosophy, which we now uh, have a very clear understanding of what um, this philosophy is about. And we had an interesting and uh, a very exciting uh, stakeholder engagement in Ghana where we, you know, which, which was more of a, a process focused co learning, co creating, and co operating, you know, approach. And people had the opportunity to really talk and have a picture of what they perceive uh, a sustainable port using Tema uh, to be like moving into the future. And we learned a lot as a team from the methodology that was adopted. And the new knowledge that we also learned from the participants, it was amazing uh, the kind of knowledge that came out through the, the, uh, the stakeholder engagement and the, the people who were there. And you know the pictures that were built on an expectation and how some of these very interesting ideas could be taken on board in designing a port in a sustainable way. Now, with, it, with, with that particular uh, workshop, three, five things came up. Need, um, the, the need one was economic value of green ports. Need two, which we identified was improving efficiency of port functioning. And then the third one, limited hinterland connections and protection of ecotourism opportunities and protection of livelihoods. So these were things that came out broadly from the, the, the stakeholder work, uh, you know, workshop we had. What I find very exciting because uh, we hadn't connected the port activities to the Volta Delta, and we hadn't connected the port activity to other livelihoods, and we hadn't connected it to other activities that were going on. So it gave us an idea about how things can be done in an integrated way to achieve a sustainable way of, um, of a port operation, which, which to me was very, very exciting. Some of the lessons learned was the need to develop water transport. So we, we realized that can there be a link between the port activity and developing the water river system so that water transport can be, can be enhanced. And, um, and I think I remember we were discussing it during the stakeholder engagement that there will be, there will be the need, you know, because of the Akusumbo Dam, which has been built on the Volta River, there'll be the need to probably connect Tema to Akusumbo and beyond Akosombo use water transport. So it was something we were discussing during the stakeholder engagement. And I'm happy to, 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 uh, to say that Ghana government has taken that on board. Now they've connected or they've constructed a rail line from Tema to Akosombo, which will eventually result in the use of uh, or creating the water transport that we have all been looking for and which came out strongly during the stakeholder uh, engagement. And another thing that also came out, which has also been a lesson and is going to guide us moving into the future is enhancing tourism potential in the Delta and connecting it to the activities of the port. So how can the port activity enhance the tourism potential in the Delta? And in enhancing the tourism potential, how can it you know, increase the economic fortunes of people in the Delta community and thereby reducing uh, poverty in the Delta community. So it was something that also came out strongly and it was a lesson that we learned. And another lesson was balance between economic, environmental, and social aspects. How do we ensure that balance, you know, in talking about a sustainable port system or port environment? And then working with society and nature for optimum benefits, you know, a society, the nature, and then coming up with all, so that the activities of the port, as we saw in Tema, have an effect on the, the Sakumo Lagoon. How can these you know, be, be together so that they can be a win-win situation? And it was a lesson that was also learned. And also the need to protect the biodiversity and function of the ecosystem 
to support economic use of the port. So these were some of the lessons that as a team in Ghana, we learned, and I believe moving into the future is going to also influence our research direction so far as the port and then the Delta uh, environment are concerned. Again, this study or this research also developed some collaboration, which I find very exciting. Uh, a strong collaboration has been developed because of the interaction through this project we had with the Ghana ports uh, between the University of Ghana and the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, which is very, very good for us. Uh, it has resulted in now students going there for site visits. So it, it has eased the protocols. You know, previously you had to go through a lot of protocols, but the connection and the interaction that was developed through this project, we are now leveraging on that. And through that, we've sent students there on a, on a field course, and the students are also doing some of their projects work there. The interaction, the interaction that was developed in the collaboration, we also invited the, the former director of, of the Tema Port to come and give a presentation of the activities of the port to our students. And uh, so he came and presented a very nice seminar, which was very well received in the Department of Marine and Fishery Sciences. And again, the collaboration has also resulted in students from the, uh, sorry, uh, officials from the port desiring to come and do their PhD studies in, 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 in the university. Um, and I had a, a chat last two weeks with one of the, of the, the chief port surveyor. He wants to come and do his PhD. And we had a lot of interaction with him during the, 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 the project period. So it is also resulting in people taking advantage to develop capacity, which I find uh, very exciting. And again, I also had interaction with the environmental department of the ports. And it was smooth sailing because we had to, we didn't need to start a conversation. We we're continuing a conversation from where, where the, the, the project, you know, had taken us to. And I saw it as very exciting because we we're trying to look at, you know, problems that we can look at together and see how best we can, we can help them in solving some of the problems in the port. And all these things are coming up because of the project we had uh, and then the interactions we had with them. And through that, I was also invited to come and speak to the board of the Ghana Ports and Harbor Authority. But unfortunately, that could not come on because of COVID and other related issues. But the fact that the, the overall board of the Ghana Ports and Harbor Authority inviting us to come and share the results of this project with them, to me, is a sign that the project has really made a lot of impact on the activities of the port. The project also resulted in exchange of students where students from Netherlands came to Ghana and students from Ghana also had opportunity to visit Netherlands. And I must say that the students who came to Ghana from Netherlands had the opportunity of meeting the officials involved with the Marine Drive project. This is a huge proposed project in Ghana. And the student had opportunity, they gave a presentation to the officials of this project, which was very exciting. And the officials were looking at how can the activities influence or impact on the marine drive project. And I must say that once the project takes off, inputs or uh, some of the things that this project has come up with will feature prominently in, 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 in the project. So it's created an avenue for student exchange where Ghanaian students interacted effectively with students from the Netherlands and the Netherlands students also interacted with students from Ghana, which to me develop a, a base where networking is, is, is being built at, at that level, which I find very exciting. So Ghana team also assisted Liz, as she mentioned, we assisted her with her project work, you know, with stakeholder identification, stakeholder engagement, the validation of her results, and our you know, input to the work she did uh, is also helped in, in coming out with a policy brief, which, which, which I am personally going to take out and then uh, share with people so that it can also influence uh, decision making. And again, we also uh, help her in um, coming out with her, her paper, a manuscript which has been submitted to the Journal of Postal and Ocean Management, 
which is also under review. So it was an exciting period and very good output coming out from this project, which has also inured to the benefit of scientists in Ghana. This beautiful thing that came out from the project is amazing because uh, a wonderful story book. I, I find it very interesting because you can, you can connect with people with regards to their views so far as the port is concerned. The ordinary man on the street that naturally you wouldn't have considered as a major or a key stakeholder in the port activity. This book is a collection of the views of these people, how they perceive the port and what they perceive the port to be in a sustainable way moving into the future. And this amazing book, um, um, I've shared a lot, a lot of, I've, I think I've almost downloaded the copies that I have. Uh, deposited copies in the libraries here, my department and then our main library. And it, it sort of connects you with the ordinary man on the street, the person who the day-to-day -day activities of the port impact. So it, it gives you an idea about how they perceive the port and what they think about the port. So the book is still telling the story to several people in real life. So at the end of this project, the story will continue to be told. And I see it as a legacy that the project is leaving behind. And uh, everywhere you go, people are very happy with the book. And we, will, we, we hope that more copies will come jail so that we can continue to distribute for people to get connected with the activities of this project and activities of the port. So let me conclude by saying that the project has developed our understanding of sustainable ports. So it has also uh, you know, given us a new direction with regards to research in Ghana, so far as the port, the ecosystem, and the Volta Delta is concerned. It also given us the need to bring everybody on board in sustainable port design. It's, it's given us the, the understanding that port cannot operate in isolation especially in developing countries. Everybody must come on board. And that is the story the book is telling. And finally, the Tema Port. We, from this project, we identified as a key economic development uh, partner or economic development of the Volta Delta. The economy of the Volta Delta hinges so much on the activities of the Tema Port. And the activities of the Tema Port influences a lot or significantly on the economy of the uh, the Volta Delta. So on this note, let me say a big thank you to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kwasi. Uh, Helena already uh, chatted it. It's great to hear about uh, the results of the collaboration. And uh, there was a question about the availability of the book. The book is indeed downloadable through the website, I believe. I, I, I uploaded it already uh, uh, some time ago. So that's uh, you can get all the information there is. And I think uh, Professor Kwasi very much illustrated uh, how you can connect and also release a lot to the local population. But we have some time now before two o'clock for additional questions. Is there anybody from the group? There are 36 connected that uh, has a question at the moment. Can I ask a question? This is Han Winterweb speaking yeah. on behalf of uh, NWO Steering Committee. Um, I very much like what has been uh, has been explained. Uh, and uh, if you know me, you know you would not have to convince me of this approach. But the question I would like to ask to the team, what arguments would you use to uh, implement this green port uh, philosophy to critical traditional port authorities whose main interest is to run a port from an economical point of view. Somebody likes to respond to Han? Ida, you know the answer to this. Yes, you I know. Yeah. Yes, well, I can answer. I would first ask them about their problems, uh, because every port authority has problems with the community, the local community, and the environment and pressures. And they they are all the, most of them have been reactive in the past. So if they start to realize that the reactive 
the opposition doesn't work to push the port and they see all these examples because when you hear the story when you go for instance when you take people to the mass flag that they're convinced that the different way is the better way and, and I, I hear it also from the story from professor quasi and and the question on the way but if you if you can connect to the local local people um, you you have you do a much much better job so i i think it's it's a very easy answer home and i would not i would not worry about that so much at all but for that you need to be in contact with these uh, these people of course eh? you need to you yes. need to make the step that you sit at the table and yes. start the dialogue yeah. yeah so i can answer that that's exactly why our approach didn't focus on just the country of Ghana. That's why we went, went for those Pan-African port networks, because we know that port development happens in those circles, and we've got ourselves into those circles. Tito talks frequently to people who are thinking about port development in Africa. We, um, Viber is contacted by people wanting to use his database because it's, and it's actually not very, a very sciencey community. It's a it's a hard finance international terminal operators community. And, um, and we are heard there. We, we, we have made our mark there. We, we, we get asked. I think you can also ask Harry. Um, Harry, do you want to say anything about this community of people who, who, who you almost have to spread the word in the network and they hear about us from others and then we gain credibility in that way. That was exactly part of our strategy. I have a question. Yeah, is there, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Mavada? Is the, Harry, do you, would you like to react? Yeah. Yes, yes, uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, quite an interest, I think. Uh, for, first of all, I want to say a big uh, thank you for all the presentations so far. They are quite incisive. And then, uh, and then as uh, Professor Pianin had mentioned, it's, it's opening up a whole uh, 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 ideas as to what is needed and what could be done and bringing a good appreciation on what Greenport's all about. And also, like Jill said, yes, uh, this kind of uh, bottom-up approaches and networking is, is a good way of uh, getting people uh, to understand and also appreciate what is being done and for information uh, dissemination. Uh, people, uh, ports in Africa, have mostly focused only on their economic benefits. So it's all about profits. In the meantime, uh, they are creating a lot of environmental challenges and also for, with implications for society. So um, getting all these kind of different actors who uh, uh, officially are not really connected into policy making and decision making becomes more interesting because you hear their voices and they are the people being really impacted. Whether benefits are good or, or, or negative, they really feel it and they have a role to play in, in getting the right solutions. And so therefore, yes, uh, these uh, approaches are very important. Different countries would have it in different ways, but uh, the two is basically the same. We just identify who and who are necessary and important and find ways of connecting to them. And then the chain will go continue in that way and eventually brings uh, everybody on board. It takes time, yes. And also uh, the different uh, political, administrative, institutional systems are different in different countries. But once you understand how it goes, you will be able to find the right approaches. It's, it's, it's possible and it's doable. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Harry. Uh, Ham, would you like to, to, to write a reply or can we go to the question of Mr. Papa Mavada Vada? No, please continue. I'm happy with the answers. Okay, well then I give you the word. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to attend this workshop, but uh, I do apologize if uh, I ask some questions uh, outdated because I just joined the process now at the final workshop. Maybe many things have been said uh, in between, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living in, in Senegal, in Dakar, and as you may know, uh, the Senate Dakar Post Authority is uh, now uh, designing and uh, start building a new port uh, not very far from Dakar, 
in Diane. And uh, there are some, some, some issues with the local communities uh, thinking that uh, they are uh, grabbing some lands there. And also many environmentalists also are raising voices saying that uh, there is not enough environmental, uh, taking into account environmental uh, uh, concerns. So uh, that's why I, 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 I like very much your approach, uh, the, this uh, multidisciplinary and uh, bottom-up approach. And also, I think that uh, uh, Slinger said that uh, you have a, a network, uh, African network post authorities. And I would like to know if, if uh, in your network you have uh, the Senegal Post Authority, because I, I, I'm, I'm working at Wetlands International, and our aim is really to, to what we call uh, nature-based solutions in uh, wetlands. So that's why I am very interested in, in your process. And uh, maybe uh, why not join you with uh, this Post Authority in, in, in Dakar? in order, if they have not taken into account uh, this uh, nature-based solution, I think that maybe it's not too late to do it. And I, I really want to, 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 to know, and eventually, if you think that the Wetlands National could play a role, because it's also in our, 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 our objectives, really, to join uh, uh, communities and to, to, to engage with private sector also in order to have sustainable solution. Excuse me again. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. It's two o'clock now, but I, I want a short reply that uh, we're very, very welcome to meet us and that you finally discover us and we discover you because I think we should collaborate. We can help. And we know the network in Africa, certainly through Harry Barnes. And we, we, have, we have contact with all the port authorities in Central and West Africa. So um, it should be, be, be a, an, easy to, to start cooperation. It's not easy to get where you want to go because it takes time. But that's my short answer for the moment. Uh, when I look at Bauchi, shall we go for the break now, Jill, Bauchi? Uh, Tilo, before you go up, uh, one, one, one uh, uh, yeah. interjection. Uh, Papa, we have a uh, part of Dakar as part of our network and uh, they are very ready now to, to, to talk to go the direction of uh, in, in integrating environmental considerations in their, in their policy making. So uh, we're already working on a few projects. We can discuss this later. So they are really uh, on board. And so we can- Okay, maybe board. let's keep in touch and, and, yeah, and we'll yeah, work together yeah, on yeah. that. Thank I've you sent very you much. A LinkedIn, I've sent you a LinkedIn requ uh, connection request. So if you have- Thank you. We can thank you very much. Yeah. All right, thank you. Jill? Yes, I think uh, we should um, go for the for the break so that everybody can stretch their legs for 10 minutes. And um, I think those connections uh, well, uh, obviously uh, are made already through LinkedIn. But we, uh, if you need uh, connections to other people in the, um, in this uh, workshop, you can also address Tito or Jill, and and they will uh, also connect you people. So. Um, we'll see you back in 10 minutes, uh, or well, eight minutes by now, 10 minutes past two. Yeah, and you can continue the chatting, okay? See you soon. Bye-bye. See you in a minute.